I'd like you to go to the Gospel of Luke tonight, chapter 10. Gospel of Luke, chapter 10. A few weeks ago, we had a camp here at International Headquarters, which was just for the Corps. It's called a Corps Way Family Camp. And during that camp, we got into a few things in the word on serving God, loving God, and really developing an understanding. And I think that now we begin to understand what understanding is all about, <laughs> at least a portion of it. We don't know it all, but we just keep learning things day by day. And so tonight I'd like to share with you some of the things that we were working on in the Gospels here regarding understanding, regarding how we love God, how we serve God, and some of these things. You know, somebody, we were sitting out in the woods the other night. We have, for those of you that are new here, how many is this the first time you've ever been here? Let me see your hand. Beautiful. Well, we welcome you to International Headquarters. This is not a rare occasion. We have new people every week. But we're certainly glad you came tonight. I understand we got a few here from Cleveland and Columbus in for this occasion, a few out South Dakota and or North Dakota. What is it? South Dakota. That's it. So we certainly welcome all of you. But we were we do things out in the woods once in a while, like sit around the campfire and uh, pray together and share a few things like that. And it's just one of the greatest places on the grounds here outside of the Biblical Research Center here. I think there's a lot of things happening here. But out in the woods, we just have a quiet time in the evening once in a while and sit around, pray together, and so on. But we were sitting out there, and somebody nudged me that was sitting next to me and was telling me about some of the questions that they have been asked by different people. And, you know, questions are real interesting because either somebody is looking for an answer, that's number one, or number two, they're looking for a fight. <laughs> <laughs> questions are either honest questions where somebody's looking for an answer, and when you go to God's Word and you have questions, if you approach it honestly, you're looking for answers. But if you approach it from the other point of view, you're looking for a fight. And this is what happened to these people. It's happened to me. It's happened to many of you, I'm sure, where people have asked you questions, not for the sake of answers, but for the sake of just tempting you, just trying to try you out or something like this. How many times has this happened to Jesus Christ as you read the Gospels? Many, many times where the scribes of Pharisees and the other seas were tempting Jesus, <laughs> that's right, tempting, just asking him questions for one reason, and that was just to tempt him. They weren't looking for answers. They were looking for a fight. <laughs> well, they got it once in a while. And in Luke 10, verse 25, you have one example of this, where it says, Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and did what? Amen. Tempted him, saying... Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Was he really concerned about how do I get eternal life? Shucks, no, he had all the answers. He knew it all. You know, he was, you know, a lawyer, a doctor of the law, someone that had been ra raised in the Jewish schools, right, Cliff? <laughs> sure. <laughs> He was one that knew the law. And he asked, well, how shall I inherit eternal life? But the only reason he asked the question was to do what? Tempt him. See it? That's the only reason he asked him, to tempt him. And Jesus said unto him, well, what's written in the law? <laughs> You're a lawyer. What's written in the law? You know, a lawyer of the Old Testament. What's written there, he says to him. How readest thou? What do you read? You got glasses. <laughs> Maybe they didn't in those days. But anyway, what do you read there? And verse 27, he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind and thy neighbor as thy what? Self. And Jesus said unto him, 
Thou hast answered right. Isn't that beautiful? This do, and thou shalt live. What was the right answer? To love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. Those four things. To love God with all of your heart. To love God with all of your soul. To love God with all of your mind, or strength. And to love God with all of your mind. Now, you have this same or a similar record in the Gospel of Matthew. In Matthew 22, 35 to 38, if you want to write it down. But we're going to Mark, chapter 12. In Matthew, the record in Matthew, you have essentially the same thing as you have here in Luke. Two different things, you know, Scripture build up and so on. But in the Gospel of Mark, we've got this record as well. And the thing is, in the King James, you have a variation in order between the three Gospels. But there are manuscripts, which we've documented this, that have them all in the same order. And I want to go to this one in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12, because there's a reason for it being loving God with your heart, soul, strength, and mind. There's a reason for that. It's not just thrown in there in any order just for kicks. You know, God didn't say to Mark or to Luke, now I want you to write this and just throw it together any way you want to. No, no. It's God's Word, right? And if it's God's Word, then it, and if God is perfect, then this Word has to be what? Perfect. That's right. The Word has to be perfect. The order of the Word has to be perfect. The order of the Word's in the Word. The Word has to fit in the verse, the verse, the context, and all the other things. Remember? Pfl chapter 5. <laughs> or someplace in there. <laughs> this is biblical research. When you go to the Word, approaching it, from God's point of view. Either it is God's word or it ain't. <laughs> it isn't, right? Either it's God's word or it isn't. Well, if it's God's word, it has to be perfect, just like God is. Otherwise, we might as well get honest and throw the thing away. Go do something else. Eat, drink, be merry. See? Well, in Mark chapter 12, you've got this record again. Chapter 12 in verse 28 where one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy, what? With all thy, with all thy, and with all thy strength. Now, again, there is a text that has them, has the word strength and the word mind in the same order that it is in Luke. And like I said, there's a reason for it. There's a purpose for the order of the words in God's word. God has a godly designed purpose for that order. He says, this is the first commandment. Now, what is it to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind? First of all, I want you to look at a record. Keep your finger here. We're coming back to Mark. In Deuteronomy. And I want to cover this record before we go into some of these other things. Because to understand some of the things that are given in Mark a little later, we need to know where this first occurred in the Word. And that's in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy what? Might. There you have it. With all thy heart, soul, and might. And might is the same as the word strength in the New Testament. Strength, might. See, With all your heart, your soul, and your strength or might. Now, in the New Testament record where Jesus was working with the people, 
the word, they add a fourth one to this. And if Jesus added, I don't doubt it. <laughs> but he adds the word mine to the end of these three. Do you see why it was given as heart, soul, strength, and then mind? Because this was a term foreign to the record in the Old Testament. But here we're in a new administration when Jesus Christ comes. Heart, soul, strength, and mind. Now, we go back to Mark. First of all, the word heart. To love God with all your heart. What is the heart? The heart is the innermost part of the mind. In Proverbs, it tells us that out of the heart come the issues of life. That's where all of your life policies come from, out of the heart, where your decisions are made, where your believing emanates from, or negative believing, positive or negative. It all comes out of the heart, which is the innermost part of your mind. So your mind is where all of your thoughts are. But the innermost part of that mind is the heart. To love God with all your heart means to love Him with not just the thoughts you've got up here on the top, but with the innermost part of your mind, with, with all of your believing, with all of your life's decisions, your policies of life, your issues of life, with everything you've got in your mind to love God with that. That's what the word heart means. To love God with all of our hearts, that means that we must get that word into our heart. You know how you get the word in your heart? Number one, you've got to study it. You've got to put that word on in your mind, right? Does the word just automatically float up there and park? Does it? Huh? No. The word has to be read and put on, studied, put on in the mind. But just because I read it and I put it on up here, does that mean that it's automatically in the innermost part of my mind? No. I've still got to work that word till it really becomes a part of my, of my mind. The innermost part of my mind, my heart. You study the word. And secondly, you control your thoughts. You study the word and then you control the thoughts in your mind. Like Bishop Pillai used to say, he always said, you know, he was from the Eastern culture in India, and they would talk to their minds. they say, now mind, behave. <laughs> Don't think that way, think this way. He says, you come home and see your house burning. The average person says, oh my goodness, where am I going to live? But he said, not the Easterner, he make his mind behave. That's all right, we'll just build another one. Well, what can you do about when he, when you get honest? <laughs> the house is burned. Well, pour some water on it. <laughs> Sit there jumping up and down all full of fear. That doesn't help anything, does it? Shucks, no. You just say, that's all right. We'll build another one. But in the meantime, you work like crazy pouring water on the thing. A few other things. Or call the fire department if there's one available. <laughs> well... You study the word and you control your thoughts. Make your mind behave according to the word. See, get that word in the innermost part of your mind, which is your heart. And when that word is in the heart, then you're able to believe and to get results. Somebody told me, what's his name? Khrushchev memorized the four gospels. Remember him back two years ago? Memorized the four gospels. Sure did him a lot of good. <laughs> He may have had it up here on the top, but did he have it in the heart? In the innermost part of his mind? No. See? You've got to get that word in the innermost part of your mind if it's going to produce results. When that word is in your mind, then your life's decisions will be righteous. Then you do what's according to the word. You think what's according to the word instead of thinking according to the world. Get the L out of the world. That's right. You got the word. That's right. Just get on it. Well, you study the word and you control your thoughts to think what the word says. So that word gets into your heart. You, can, you do this by 
thinking what the Word says you are. Well, what does the Word say you are? Does it say you're a nobody? No, the Word says you're a son of God, for one thing. It says you're righteous. It says you've got justification, redemption. You've got wisdom. That's what we ought to be confessing instead of confessing what the world says. The world says you're nothing. (laughs) The Word says you are someone. You're a son of God. Beloved, now are we the sons of God and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be what? For we shall see him as he is. Confess what the word says. To recognize who you are as God's son. You control your thoughts to see yourself doing what the word says you should do. Yeah. You know, you've heard of daydreaming. Why do you want to daydream about the world? Why not dream what the word says you can do? Like witness, like teach, like walk in love, like helping your brother. See? Control your thoughts. Do this mental practice where it builds that word in your life. And just staying your mind on God. You know, you can stay your mind on a lot of things. Stay your mind on that microphone over there. That microphone's not going to help you. Why not just get your mind stayed on God? He's the one that gives you peace. He's the one that fills your life with joy. But just controlling your thoughts. That's how you build the word in your heart. That's what it means to love God with all of your heart. To get that word in the innermost part of your mind. Then you've got heart. Wherever the mind is perfectly renewed on God's word. That's where we've got heart. Where the word is in our heart that's heart (laughs) and boy we as Christians ought to have heart by having God's word not just on the top of our head but in the innermost part of that mind in the heart where your mind is perfectly renewed on God's word you've got heart many times in the ministry You hear the word in the Power for Abundant Living class. You get real excited about it. Isn't it the greatest thing it ever was? (laughs) Greatest class in the world. But we don't always keep that excitement that we've got about the word. Boy, it ought to be as you keep building that word in your mind. Do you think Jesus Christ ever got down? (laughs) Do you think he ever just wanted to quit? No, he kept that word alive in his heart. He kept it burning within his soul, his heart. Well, as you work that word, you get it into your heart, then you start producing results in your life. That's loving God with all of your heart. And as you do that, as you practice in your mind, building that word in your mind, you know what it does for the Christian? It lays up rewards for him. It not only produces immediate success and results in your life, but it also lays up rewards for you in the future. It doesn't do that for natural man, the man of body and soul, the man who's, who doesn't have Christ within him. He may try building his mind, practicing things in his mind, But all it does is bring him immediate success. Some of our salesmen, some of our sportsmen, some of the most successful people in the world, from the world's point of view, well, why not? They use this type of mental control where they control their minds, the discipline they have mentally, but it only brings them immediate success. But for the Christian, it brings him immediate success And it also lays up rewards for when Christ returns. It's kind of neat when you start to work the word. I'm covering a lot of things this evening because these are are things that all tie into it. Now, some of you may have to take this and work it like this thing on rewards. 
This has been taught before, where you, you go into the Word and check out. Well, you know what your rewards are? Find out what the Word says about it. See? Work some of these fields. But all this ties into loving God with all of your heart, the innermost part of the mind. Secondly, it says, to love God with all of your soul. Where is the soul life? In the blood. Remember Leviticus 17.11? The soul life is in the blood. That soul life is the real you. When Adam, when God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, Adam became a living soul. A living soul. When you've got that breath life within you, you've got soul life. Not spirit, but soul life. That soul life, it says in Leviticus, it's in the blood. Now, if it's in the blood, does that have any effect upon your body? What parts of the body don't you have blood in? Your toenails? <laughs> Maybe your fingernails? I don't know. Very few. That blood flows throughout the whole body. That's why that soul life has a tremendous effect upon the physical life. As your soul prospers, it says in John, First John or 3 John, what is it? 3 John 2. As your soul prospers, what happens to the, your body? Health. You get health. You know, physical strength. As well as financial strength. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in what? Even as thy what? As your soul prospers, so your physical body prospers. That's why you love God with all of your soul. In other words, with all of your life. And you know what happens? That means you're in health, for one thing. You've got life beyond what the world could imagine. You've got life, you've got health. Because your soul prospers. To love God with all of your soul is simply to do that which is right according to the word. And again, how do you know what is right in your life according to the word? Unless you first have that word in your heart. In the innermost part of your mind. That's why it starts with the heart and goes to the mind. So you get it in your soul life. Practicing God's word in your life. Practicing God's word in your life. Not just having it up here. What good does it do if I memorize the whole word but never practice it? What good would it do me? Not a lousy bit. But boy, if I put it on up here and utilize it, practice it, then I get health, I get prosperity, all these other things God has promised in his word. I heard somebody say it this last week during the Word and Music Seminar. One verse of Scripture that you have mastered, not just up here, but in practice in your life, is worth more than 50 verses that you've memorized but never practiced, never utilized. Isn't that beautiful? You can memorize a thousand scriptures, but never utilize them. What good would it do? But when I put one verse on up there, and I use it, I practice it, I excel with it, then I'm at least blessed one verse worth. Right? Sure. <laughs> oh, it's terrific. Love God with all your heart, the innermost part of your mind, and with all of your soul, your life, your full life. Not just a part of it, your full life. And thirdly, love God with all of your what? What? Strength. Right? Love God with all of your strength. Strength is your ability, which is the action part. Your strength. It's your action Love God in everything that you do. You've got it in your heart. You've got it in your life. 
and you've got it in your action. That's what it means to love God with all of your strength. You've got it in your action. This is the record of the Old Testament as well as the first part of the records in the New Testament. To love God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, which is your action. Look, if I say I'm believing, like it says in James, believing gets results, right? Right. Believing gets results. Right. Okay. <laughs> but now, if I'm not believing, but I say I'm believing, are there going to be any results? No. Follow it? That's why it says in James, you show me your works by uh, your believing, and I'll show you my believing by my works. <laughs> Do you comprehend all that? Look, I say I'm believing, but I have no results, no action. Am I believing? No. But if I've got action, if I've got results, then you know I'm doing what? Believing. See it? Then you know I'm believing. <laughs> That's why our strength, it's our ability, it's in action, shows that we are believing. Then you're loving God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, your life, and with all of your strength in action. Fourthly, it says to love God with all of your what? Mind. The reason this is added in this New Testament record is because this is the starting point. You love God with all your heart, your all your soul, and with all your strength, just like it said in the Old Testament. But how do you begin? What do you start with? Your big toe? Your little finger? No. By putting the thoughts from God's word on up here in the mind. You cannot have a mind transplant. You cannot take your mind out and put another one on that's perfectly renewed. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Someone this last week was covering part of this subject. And they said, you cannot go down to the store and buy a new model. <laughs> You know, walk into the store and say, oh my goodness, look, isn't that pretty? I think I'll have that blue one. Somebody else, well, no, I want that green one. You can't do that. You can't go buy a new mind. You change your mind one thought at a time by taking God's word and putting it on in your mind. That's where it all begins. It starts in the mind with the thoughts. And as you gradually put on more thoughts of God's word, it gets into the heart, into your life, into your walk, your action. Then you love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, your strength, and with all your mind. See, that's what it means. To love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. Then it says in the next verse, And the second is like, namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thy what? So, there is none other commandment greater than these. To love your neighbor as yourself. Do you think that would be any less than what the first one was? You know, it's the second commandment, but I mean any less as far as do you just love God with, or love your neighbor with one thought? <laughs> No, it means all the way down to the action category. Sure, if you love your neighbor, you bless him. It has action with it. Heart, soul, action, the whole trip. That's right. To love your neighbor. You know, natural man, the man of body and soul, can't do that. You know why he can't love his neighbor? Because he really can't love himself. Remember what Rufus Mosley used to say? God's all the time voting for you. The devil's all the time voting again you. You determine the election. <laughs> now, a natural man cannot be voting for himself. <laughs> so how can he possibly love his neighbor? 
unless he loves himself. Boy, with the word, when you vote for yourself, you love yourself. And yet, that's a tremendous key in life and in your walk. If you don't love yourself, how do you ever expect to love your neighbor, to love anyone else? That's why it begins with building that word in your own life. You care about other people, but you care about yourself too, learning that word. And it's only because it, to really care for yourself, you put God first. And all these other things are subtracted from you. No, they're added unto you. Put God first in your life because you're concerned. You love yourself. Sure, you don't want to go to hell. <laughs> or any other place outside of heaven. Sure, we have a great time. <laughs> you love God. You love yourself. Then you're able to love your neighbor. That's right. Natural man cannot make that, that claim. He may make it, but <laughs> it's a, simply a claim. In verse 32, The scribe said unto him, Well, master, thou hast said the truth, for there is one God, and there is none other but he. And to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, and with all the soul, and with all the strength, and to love his neighbor as himself is more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered discreetly, that's the word judiciously, he answered judiciously, he said unto him, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. And no man after that durst ask him any questions. Jesus saw that this man answered him judiciously. He answered him according to the law. You know what that means? That means we better look at verse 33 again. <laughs> to love him with all the what? Heart. Did Jesus say that? Yes. With all the what? Understand. Did Jesus say that? No. No. Well, let's look at the rest of it. With all the soul and with all the strength. Did Jesus say those last two? Yes. Those were also the three that were in Deuteronomy 6.5. Do you remember? We read it just a little bit ago. The same three. The only one he turned around was the word mind, which became, which he said, understanding. That's right. That's why he said he answered him judiciously. Now, this is re a real interesting word here. And this is where I really wanted to go tonight. To love God with all the mind, you understand. To put the word on, get the word foremost in your mind. But the understanding is simply a function of that mind. The Greek word is sunesis. That's the word understanding. Sunesis, I'll spell it for you. S-U-N-E-S-I-S. S-U-N-E-S-I-S. <clears throat> Sunesis is a function of the mind, and it's correctly translated understanding. But there's more to it than that. This word was originally used about 800 years before Christ by Homer, and in those days it was used of two rivers flowing together. Here you have a river coming down out of the mountains over here, and here you have another river coming down out of these mountains. And those rivers flow together. That's how this word synesis was used. Where the rivers flowed together. Is that beautiful? See how these rivers flow together? That's synesis. And that's the word that came, became or came later to mean understanding. What a beautiful description of understanding. Where the thoughts flow together in our mind. That is understanding. Like the rivers that flow together. So the thoughts that come into our mind, when they flow together, then you have understanding. Do you know how you get the thoughts in your mind to flow together? Well, you think things through, for one thing. But I want to tell you something. Natural man 
cannot have a very good understanding unless he gets a knowledge of the word. Then he has to become a spiritual man, body, soul, and spirit. When that knowledge starts to flow together in your mind, then you have understanding, like the rivers flowing together. That's understanding. Do you understand? <laughs> when I begin to take the thoughts that I've heard from my philosophy professor and the thoughts I've had from my religious professor and the thoughts that I've had from my mathematics professor and the thoughts that I've had from who knows what professor and the thoughts from God's Word. When those thoughts are first put into my mind, there's a conflict. Because one person says this, somebody else says that, somebody else says this, and so you've got your river splitting out. Instead of getting a flowing together, you got them flowing out, forming many different rivers. But when that word starts to bring all those thoughts together, I develop an understanding. That's when they flow together. See it? This word, synesis. In English, there is a word, synesis, S-Y-N-E-S-I-S, -S, that came from this Greek word. It's a grammatical construction that conforms to sense or meaning rather than to syntax. Now let me explain all that. Suppose I violate what my grammar teacher told me. But by doing that, what I'm saying makes more sense. That is synesis. You know, there are rules of grammar. You've all had English somewhere along the line, haven't you? <laughs> English grammar. And it says, you know, the subject is plural, therefore the verb has to be what? Plural. The subject is singular, the verb has to be what? Singular. All rules of grammar. But sometimes it's necessarily necessary to violate those rules so it makes better sense. <laughs> That's synesis. Where you're after the meaning, where the thoughts come together rather than just a strict, rigid law. Boy, that's something. Uh, let me give you an example. I got this from the dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't have to be real smart. Just <laughs> be able to read. <laughs> Has everyone washed his hands? Has everyone washed his hands? Now, if I say, has everyone, that's singular. Therefore, I say, washed his, singular, hands. That's what you would say normally, according to grammar. But it doesn't make much sense. It sounds like everybody's washing one person's hands, doesn't it? <laughs> so I violate the grammar so it makes better sense. And I say, has everyone washed their hands? That's synesis. That's what this Greek word came from. Where it makes better sense, where the understanding, it flows together rather than a strict, rigid law. You know, the laws of the Old Testament were fairly rigid. The scribes and Pharisees and a few others made them more rigid than what God intended. <laughs> It said, for one thing, you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. Right? Not supposed to work on the Sabbath. But, Jesus Christ went out in the cornfields and they picked corn. He healed people on the Sabbath. My goodness. The scribes and the Pharisees, they got all upset about this because that's the law. Like the grammar, that's the law. Do you know what Jesus did? He just went above the law because there's a bigger law called love. <laughs> that
There were people in need on that Sabbath day. And you know what he did? He ministered to them. That's right. He went beyond the natural law and went to a more spiritual law. That's right. Where you violate the rigid in order for the meaning. That's understanding. You know, the word is very clear on a lot of things. And many times you may not know, well, should I do this or shouldn't I? Where you develop an understanding of that word, you know what to do in those situations. Have you ever encountered, been encountered with a situation like that where you didn't know which which was right and which was wrong? The more of that word you build in your mind, the greater the understanding. The things flow together. And we're after understanding, not just rigid laws, <laughs> but an understanding. That's that word cynicism. There's also a figure of speech called cynicism which means a jointing, a joining or meeting together. See it? Still means to join or mean or to meet together. This word synesis is used first of all here in this Mark 12:33 where it's translated understanding. To have an understanding, it's a function of the mind. To love God with all of your understanding, where all of your thoughts flow together. That's love. And that's understanding. It's also used in Luke chapter 2. I want you to look at it. Luke chapter 2. In verse 47. Here was Jesus at the temple, 12 years old. We've got to start in verse 36. 46, excuse me. And it came to pass that after three days, they found him, Jesus, in the temple. He's 12 years old, sitting in the midst of the doctors, PhDs, <laughs> both hearing them and asking them what? Question. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. That word understanding is the word synesis. At 12 years old, they were flabbergasted at the understanding that Jesus had. That guy must have been a grade A student. <laughs> to have an understanding that would flabbergast the scholars. At the age of 12. Boy, oh boy, oh boy. He was a man's man, huh? He had an understanding. The thoughts flew, to, uh, f flew, <laughs> flowed together in his mind. It wasn't that his rivers split. See? His rivers came together. He had an understanding. You know, somebody throw this bit of knowledge in there. Somebody else throw this bit of knowledge in there. And he had that word in his mind, the Old Testament word. And boy, everything just flowed together. He understood at 12 years old. And you know what it says in verse 52? And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Isn't that beautiful? He didn't stop there at 12 years old. He increased in wisdom and stature. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Natural man cannot have that kind of understanding. His rivers split. Without a knowledge of God's word, you will never arrive when it comes to understanding. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1. You may, oh, incidentally, you may have, natural man can have little bits of understanding. You understand? <laughs> you know, he says, okay, here's a mathematical puzzle and here's another one. And the two seem to flow together. 
but he doesn't have those big rivers coming together in his life. Because without the word, it's impossible. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 19, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. That word understanding is synesis. God says, I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Talking about the prudent of this world. And incidentally, that word prudent is the adjective form of this word. The adjective form of this word synesis. In other words, I will bring to nothing the understanding of the understanding ones. Those who seem to understand things in the natural world, God says, they aren't going to understand a lousy thing. Their rivers will split. They, they won't come together. Right? They cannot understand without God and with his, his word. In Ephesians chapter 3, well, keep your finger in Ephesians. I want to show you something else in 2 Timothy. It doesn't have this word in it. But it's along that line of that one we just read. Second Timothy chapter 3. Talking about the natural minded men. In verse 5 it says they have a form of godliness. But denying the what? Power thereof. From such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women, laden with sins, led away with divers' lusts. They're in the swimming meet. <laughs> in verse 7, ever learning. Look at that. They're ever learning, but, or and, <laughs> never able to come to the knowledge of what? The word. <laughs> They're always learning, but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. They're always learning. Jesus Christ, was he always learning? Yes, he was. But he came to an understanding. His rivers came together. These natural men, always learning. But what? Never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Their rivers split. They never come together. Ever learning, never able to come to an understanding, to a knowledge of the truth. They may have little understanding here and there, but no major understanding of life, God, His Word, and what life's all about. In Ephesians chapter 3, in verse 4, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my Knowledge, and that word knowledge is synesis. My understanding, that you may understand or know my understanding in the what? The mystery of Christ. See? In the mystery. Did Paul have an understanding of the mystery? That's what it says. All the things of the mystery flowed together for him. That's true of very few people in the world today who really understand the mystery of God, where all the things flow together. I think most of you are among the few. <laughs> right. To understand all the things of the mystery. In chapter 1, verse 18, it says, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. The word understanding is a different Greek word here. But it includes the idea of this type of understanding where things flow together. The eyes of your understanding, where everything in your mind just flows together, that ye may know, not question, not doubt, but that ye may what? No. Know what is the hope of his calling 
and what the riches of the glory of the his inheritance in the saints and what is the little bit of power we have no what is just the greatness of his power no nope. what is the exceeding greatness of his power to your neighbor now to us word who believe boy when you've got an understanding of that things start falling in place in your life it starts clicking <laughs> your life does all right you have an understanding and so you start getting results you get answers to prayer you have power in operation in your life people healed your own life healed prosperity all these other things that jesus christ promised then you have an understanding the eyes of your understanding being enlightened see in colossians chapter one Verse 9, for this cause we also, since the day we heard, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Not just a sense knowledge understanding, but the spiritual understanding where everything flows together. In chapter 2, in verse 2, here's that beautiful Rock of Ages theme from last year that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of what? Amen. Understanding. To the full assurance of understanding, where the things flow together. Timothy, Second Timothy. Chapter 2, verse 7. Consider what I say, and the Lord give you what? Understanding, synesis, in all things. That's what it says. <laughs> the Lord give you understanding where things begin to flow together in your mind. In all things. Except, nope, <laughs> in all things. Is that what it says? Is that what it means? That's right. <laughs> in all things that God could give you an understanding where things flow together. Do you have it? Have you arrived? No. <laughs> <laughs> Neither have I. <laughs> Do you have the perfectly renewed mind? No, only Jesus Christ had that. But we keep working on it, and the more you work the Word and get that Word on up there and live it, the more of an understanding you have, the more things start falling together in your life. Do you have a greater understanding of life today than you did last year? Sure. Because you've got enough of that Word in your mind where things have begun to fall together. But to have an understanding in all things, well, we'll know even as we are known when Christ returns. But until that time, we just keep working on it. In Luke chapter 24. Getting an understanding in our life means getting the word in our mind and in the innermost part of that mind, the heart. And getting the word in your life, your soul life. And getting the word in your strength or your action. Then you love God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Because you have an understanding. Where the thoughts flow together, the word, life, and everything you've ever heard, it flows together. It makes sense. And then you just love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. You can do it with the Word. But it starts by building that Word to gain that understanding where things fall together in your life. And they don't just fall together. They flow together. 
chapter. In Luke chapter 24. Where is Luke? There it is. Chapter 24. In verse 44. This is after Jesus' ascension. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you. He's walking with these, or talking to his apostles here. It says, These are the words that I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which are written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the psalm concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And that word understand is the verb form of this word synesis. To understand the scriptures. Boy, oh boy, where all the scriptures start flowing together to understand them. That you understand why Genesis 3.15 is where it is and why Exodus 2.11 is where it is and how all these things pattern together. To understand that. Their minds, their minds were open that they could understand the scriptures. And said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. When they understood the scriptures, they knew why Jesus had to die and why God raised him from the dead the third day. They understood all the other things in life where the scriptures just brought all these things together. If there's a place that we do not have a clear picture in our mind of what life is all about, what's going on in the world, what's happening as far as the word is concerned, then it's necessary to learn more of that word, but build it in our mind to the place where all the things start coming together. All the thoughts, the ideas. Then we develop an understanding. And when you've got an understanding, you're more confident. You're more at ease. You have more trust, more boldness, more love. More of everything that God has made available and wants us to have. That's understanding. 